Broadcasting live from the inspiring vantage on the plain of Thunder Junction, this is Tap Tap Concede. Welcome everybody to Tap Tap Concede. My name is Graham. Joining me is Kathleen. Hello. And Cameron. Huh? And today we are going to be talking about Thunder Junction story and lore. Store. Nope, doesn't work. It's Thunder Junction story and lore. Uh, Lori. Lori. Yeah, that's much better. Yeah. As of Orthos. Very excited. Big implications in this set. Extremely excited. I believe I posted in all caps. Story implications! Exclamation point. Excellent. <laughs> I made I, I made you read a bunch of the stories. Yeah, I've read I've read some of them. It's it, it's good and fun. Uh, and before we dive into it, a couple things. First of all, of course, the show is brought to you by Card Kingdom. Please check out cardkingdom.com slash L R R. Buy you a cardboard there. Get yourself some Thunder Junction. Why not? Uh, tell them we sent you by saying loading ready run sent me a button, please, and they'll send you a little button. Uh, that says a funny thing, and I think we're still on I move to newt newt step, hmm. but uh, we could be on to the next one at this point. Who knows? I know that people have been newting and newting uh, and enjoying that, and so thank you. Uh, also, this show and everything we do is brought to you by you and your kind support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loadingreadyrun. It's how we're able to do all the things that we do here, so if you like the things that we do, then why not throw us a couple bucks? We'd, we'd appreciate it. Uh, also, it bears acknowledgement... That this is the 500th episode of Tap Tap Concede. Wow. Yeah. It's, uh... We've been recording this since way back in the day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we first recorded this show in Moonbase... Three. Uh, yeah, Moonbase Mark Three. In... Yeah, we're sitting around that table in the editing office. Yep. Exactly. Sort of crammed around the, like, sideways table. Around yeah. a single microphone, maybe? And, no, I think there were... I think there might have been two. Yeah. But there was, uh... The, the 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 iMac monitor in the background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the, I think that room, had a smaller footprint than the set. Yes. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like the than the set does now, and now we have all of our cameras and stuff over there. Yeah. <laughs> There's it's, so much more room for activity. If you look at our old stuff, it's legitimately impressive how far we've come and how well we've aged. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm very, I'm very proud of it. Honestly, I think I've aged like a well-rinded cheese. Mm, mm. That's my favorite kind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Paul said when we were doing the 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 twentieth anniversary retrospectives, uh, uh, you're only allowed to say, um, uh, you uh, when when looking at old footage, you're only allowed to say like, "Wow, you look so young," or whatever. If you append it with, but so much better now. Mm, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a requirement. Uh, so yeah, thanks everybody for being here for 500 episodes of Tap Tap Concede. Whether you're listening to it on, you know, it's on Apple Music and Spotify or RSS, wherever you get your stuff. If you only engage with this as an audio podcast, uh, hello. And if you watch this on the YouTube, hello to you as well. You yeah. can see our our visages, and uh, yeah. If, if you're for... only engaging with us through audio, then imagine that that previous discussion about how good we look now is 100% true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I look pretty good, honestly. I think we all look great. I started a skincare regimen. I started moisturizing. Uh, <laughs> it's true. Ooh, moisture. Apparently, that's just, <laughs> apparently, you just put moisturizer and sunscreen on, and that solves most of the problems. I, I always love in, uh, well, it struck me particularly watching Star Wars Andor. There's a character in that show who looks like she deeply, deeply resents her 17-step daily skincare regimen. <laughs> but it's working for her? Yeah, oh, she, yeah, she looks great. She's very, like, you know, she has no pores. <laughs> you know, in the tradition of, of actors. Yeah. Right. Hey, Amazing. if you have any, I would, we would love to get your thoughts about the story and what you thought and everything. So if you have your thoughts, put them in the comments, if you're watching on YouTube at least. Well, now I can't do my, my segue that I was going to do, which was to say that we could use moisturizing on Thunder Junction. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah. As no, we transition very dry. into. Yeah. I mean, maybe if these comments are just burning us, then maybe we'll need some moisturizer after that. That's yeah. some, some aloe. Yeah, it looks like, you know, right below the comment that says, Cameron looks like he ate previous Cameron. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, we can, yeah, there can also be the conversation around how Thunder Junction is the plane of the eternal nosebleed. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, it would be so bad. My eczema would be so bad on uh, Thunder Junction. Dusty, too. I yeah. would just get kicked because I sweat 
so much in the heat and I would just get caked in dust. It would be miserable. Yeah, why does everybody want to go someplace hot and dry? Yeah, I don't know. Hey, yeah. so... And, and like, yeah, just yeah, people start talking and then stop because their lips split. <laughs> How is the Gitrog monster not drying out? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's an amphibian. His skin is porous. Yeah. So, uh, okay, but thanks, let's get thanks to the everybody. Story. Thanks None everybody. Of this adds up. <laughs> thanks everybody for being here for 500 episodes of this. Uh, mm-hmm. As we uh, move now into the main topic of the episode, I'm Thunder so Junction, excited. Thunder Junction story time. So there are six chapters of the main story, and there are also six yes side stories, mm-hmm. uh, which are fun and worth reading. They're all worth reading, but the side stories are fun, and maybe we'll touch on them. But they're not relevant for sort of the the main like plot yeah of, they, the, of the thing there's a side story that gives you a little bit um uh more background on any flash which is interesting there's a side story for yuma who's one of the face commanders there's a side story that touches in on what nashi is up to oh nashi uh, nashi is um i'll just Tamio's give tamio's rat adopted student. rat oh rat right, son. right right right, uh, right and he's very sad that he's that I, i'll just give you the one sentence summary of it he's really sad that his mom is dead and he's trying to follow in his in her footsteps but it's not working out very well for him to be writing down all of these things and he can't make that work with his innate magic and then through the story he realizes he's not a writer he's a video editor <laughs> oh. so i as a video editor i was like <gasps> yeah different media yeah, different, different way of storytelling yeah, yeah yeah different way of storytelling yeah so uh nashi comes into his own powers for you know recording histories through the through his surveillance drones and taking the footage and remixing it it's literally i've never seen video editing represented it's, on a card i might want to build a nashi commander deck yeah, like, just for that and speaking of video editing i just remember seeing someone commenting about um like an academy member who said something about scorsese's uh killers of the flower moon mm. where it's like couldn't he hire an editor and it was a video editor saying, like, with that feeling when you realize that the people who are responsible for for uh, your career have no idea what your job is. Yeah. yeah. The, the, they think an editor is just to make it shorter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like... <sighs> <laughs> There's also there's also a really good story featuring Gisa and Geralt, oh. written by Shauna McGuire. If you have to read one of the side stories, that one's really funny. Anyone... Yeah, like all I I always love a good Gisa and Geralt short story, and Shauna McGuire is so good with them. She oh, has yeah. their voices. She knows them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it's not a disparagement on when other other authors tackle them, but like, yeah, I because during the. Phyrexian Invasion stories, we had the family game night Which was also a short story written by her, which was very funny. (laughs) Gisa and Geralt. Uh, And this one is called uh, Family Outing. Yes, a pleasant family outing. (laughs) And it's really fun. Uh, They get to bicker and do Gisa and Geralt things. Even Shauna McGuire uh, admits, she's like, these characters, they are the fatty bacon in your sandwich you mm-hmm. don't want an entirely bacon sandwich you just want a bit of bacon and if there was they were used too much these would these would be very annoying people because they are legitimately incredibly irritating uh- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, once, I once heard a uh a, a fairly well celebrated chef say that at a blt the b is there for seasoning like it's actually a tomato sandwich yes, seasoned with bacon yes i agree with that as a big fan of a BLT enjoyer. The tomatoes are where that sandwich lives and dies, not on the bacon. But the point being, they're the bacon. There's a really funny story. Uh, I've had a bacon sandwich. You know what? I mean, it was pretty good. Eng- England runs on bacon buddies. <laughs> yeah. But then again, it also runs on chip buddies. Mm. <laughs> yeah. What if we put potato in a sandwich? <laughs> well, let's fry it first. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, Fair God, enough. God, man. Yeah, let's let's put some deep fried potato in a bun. Uh, also, yeah, there's Geralt, there's Gisa. Uh, also, I'm just realizing this now. I definitely, when we were working on Brothers War, suggested Flesh Rite as an epithet for Ashnod, and it mm. didn't get picked. But I'm oh. super glad to see it here. Uh, yeah. So I don't know who suggested this name, but I'm going to say it was great minds thinking alike. Yeah, yeah. convergent evolution. Flesh Rite. It's, oh, that's I mean, good. It, uh, like, it... Just means somebody who puts flesh together, and that's what Ashnod does as well. Mm-hmm. So I like that Geralt specifically is curious because it's called Thunder Junction because there, there's thunderstorms on since it's the desert that's going to happen, and and uh, and he's like, hmm, 
I like using thunder to make the dead come back to life. I wonder if the Thunder Junction thunder is different and perhaps better for that. Mm-hmm. Also, just, that's the thing that he's into. Yeah, yeah. Accessible. Also, I like that Thunder Junction seems to be named that because people show up and go like, well, there's a lot of thunder here. Also, everyone is here. Yeah, it's like some sort of multi... This is this is what Niv Mizzet wants. It's some sort of multi-planar hub. And we're going to touch on the Smash Brothers aspect of everyone is here <laughs> later. Yes. We- but first, mm-hmm. uh, could... Both because I've I've read I I'm a monster I've read stories one three and six those are the most important ones all right I, that's what I said if you have to if you can't read them all read one three and six also if you can't or don't wish to read them the pages on the Magic Story website also has little sort of mini podcast audio readings of them if you choose to listen to them instead yeah. and they're like twenty minutes yeah the first one is twenty four minutes and honestly engaging with a store an audiobook still counts as reading it i'm not we're we're not yeah. hearing any of that kind of i saw a very funny stand up set of someone being like you know like listening to audiobooks talking about you know having read the books and his friends being like you didn't though you just you just listened he's like oh yeah as opposed to you that only used your eyes yeah mm-hmm. the information went into your brain yeah so engage with the engage with the stories yeah. but uh, so, Kathleen and Cameron, because you've both read w- all of one through six, what's going on in Thunder Junkins? Oh, so we start out, and Kellen is there, and he's working for some place called the Sterling Company, with the guards who are also working with Ral Zarek from Ravnica. I do. I'm not going to cut in constantly, but I do have a question, and I know that I'm asking this question out loud, even though I know that we don't have an answer to it, which is. We just saw Kellen on Ravnica in Murders at Karlov Manor, and now we're on Thunder Junction, and Kellen has been working for the Sterling Company for some time. Yeah, they're doing some time skips here, and I will say, yeah. the uh, I was able to set by Law and Order 2 to the actual fixed decided date in Magic Canon uh, of Murders at Karloff Manor because I asked Jay Anelli, the lore, the lore master, who also made those Mario mushrooms that some of you oh, enjoyed okay. so much. Yeah. Uh, but I asked Jay what the date was, but clearly we're doing some time skips. Yeah, and we don't know what that is or how long it's been, but Kellen's been on Thunder Junction for a while working for <laughs> the Sterling Company, which well, is a company that... So, sort of working for the Sterling Company, sort of working for Ral, who's working with the Sterling Company. Uh, the Sterling Company has invested in Ral's research because what Ral is doing is he's setting up um, uh, lo- he's setting up uh, telegraph lines. He's yeah. basically setting up uh, interplanar communication so you can send messages between planes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's very, is it? Ravnica is, is minutes away from, from codifying information theory. They just need their own Claude Shannon. Yeah. To to like figure out the bit and there, then we're gonna have the information age. I will say it's very funny that like most of the people that you seem to be see to be getting around are all people from Ravnica. Yeah, well like I mean I I joked the other night that Ravnica might have more people living on it than the rest of the multiverse does, just because it's an ecumenopolis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Like how many people live in Ravnica? I don't know, a trillion? All, all of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm going slightly out of order because that's not the first thing you learn in the story, but that's just important to set up. Mm -hmm. Kellen's on Ravnica. The first thing you see in a story is a little like backstory of this terrifying, not super well explained scorpion dragon named Akul just murdering someone in fairly cold blood, although he uses hot fire to do so because he's looking for something. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, then we meet Annie Flash, who is who's somebody who's got some history with Akul. Uh, and she is sort of hiding out, uh, and somebody comes and makes her a deal to uh, to come and work with her, or to come and work with them, essentially. Uh, so, yeah, so basically, and who is that? It's Oko. He, he is trying to, he's like, he says to her, if it was this easy for me to find you, imagine how easy it will be if the Hell Spurs, that's Akul's gang, ever decide to come looking, Oko said. You must really love this town to go to such great lengths to protect it. This is a very classic Western trope of, you know, yeah, like- finding the retired gunslinger who thinks they've gone on to a life of peace and quiet, and mm-hmm. then threatening sort of indirectly the town that they have grown to love and yeah. protect. So come work for me. Yeah, yeah. And and Oko wants Annie because she is, you know, 
the sharpest gun in the West. Also, she has a magical eye that can see through illusions. Yeah, they call it Angel Eye, which is a reference to I think the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's very yeah. fun. Yeah. Oh. Uh, she, she, yeah, she can if she she does not have passive ability to see through illusions. This is important. She has to turn it on, and she has to physically decide that she is looking at something and trying to see through the illusions. Mm-hmm. That becomes very relevant. That is very relevant, and people are like, "This is a plot hole." It's like, no, it's not. They say that they say multiple times that she has to engage her eye to use it, uh, and she is a member of the at- Atin eighteen. I'm not sure how they pronounce it in the reading. If they, t- but this is so. This is. Sort I didn't of, actually listen. I just know it's an option. This they are also not from Thunder Junction, but they are heavily influenced by Navajo culture, and there is a lot of cultural consultants involved in that and i love the idea of having people who actually represent that culture weigh in with how they are presented on the page for accuracy so keep doing that because it makes me personally happy Mm. to know that i'm getting good information Uh, all right so that is basically what is going on and then what happens is uh kellen gets sent to prosperity which is another town in Thunder Junction. So the town that we... Omenport? Omenport. Is like the, I guess, the main hub, just judging by the name. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then Prosperity is another town. It's sort of, sort of run by the Sterling Company, which we don't learn a lot about. I'm sure they'll kind of show up on cards. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, there's what we're... Prosperity Tycoon. Yeah. Basically, this is like the rich town. And Kellen... So Ral's like, hey, can you go to Prosperity? We need to do a thing. And and Kellen is like super excited because he figures that... Uh, that uh, if anybody's got information on his dad, they might have it in prosperity. Right. So Kellen's like, heck yeah, of course we'll go. That's it. That's the first story. It's just set up. Okay. All right. Moving on. Uh, the second story, we have a little bit more of Annie and a little bit more background on her. And we she meets up at the Wild Card Saloon in Rustwood. And she meets there and she... she Why are they like this? What? Well, it's just, it's just, it's an unusual thing for everyone to go here and decide. You know what? We're all going to adopt this aesthetic. What? Why? What is the? Where does this come from? Uh, we just made it up. <laughs> it's fine. It's, I'm not really, I'm not really nitpicking about it. I just think it's very funny if you like. It's one of those things where it's like, yeah, it's fine. But if you like really try to think about it too hard and think about an in-universe reason for why everyone's wearing wide-brimmed hats and long leather sun coats. Protection. And... Sun protection. No, I know, but like why it's all like, ah, oh, yeah, the saloons and why, just why everything looks and is the way that it is. It's just sort of like, there's no real reason for this, but I don't care, so. I don't know. People get there. You know, Ravnik has already had an explosion of interesting hats, and then when they got there, by I'm assuming the Ravnikans were the first very uh, ambitious and capitalism-minded people to get there, honestly. And they went, oh, God, okay, we've got all these hats, but, God, it's so bright here, could we make the brims wider? Mm-hmm. It's not that much of a stretch from a detective hat to a cowboy hat. No, no, I mean, yeah, that they, they have similar... Taller roots. to get more air circulation? Yeah, and then, you know, you have your cowboy boots so that you can ride a, um, a, a saddled animal without <laughs> ripping your ripping your legs off if you slip out of the saddle. Yeah. yeah. And uh and it's also important that there's uh there's very few there's not like a lot of like mass transportation yet because it's largely unsettled so people riding around like horses and beasts and uh, I saw a preview today of uh of a snake horse, a snorse. I saw a, there's a card that they spoiled yesterday I think that looks like a, someone's riding chocobos. Hmm. Like they really look like blue chocobos on this card. It's a some sort of combat trick. Ooh. Um, the uh, uh, I like to imagine I've just invented this now that yeah from Ravnica some sort of craftsperson like a goblin was like one of the first people over here and was just like hmm I can be uh, economically ambitious and just started selling the big hats and then everyone knew who arrived was like Oh, I guess that's what we do here. I uh, better get myself a big hat. Yeah. First, <laughs> yeah. they're like, I'm not paying for that big hat. Go out in the sun. They're like, actually, I would like a hat with a wide brim. I, w- I, yeah, I, 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 I change my mind. And then, you know, mm-hmm. somebody writes it down in a book saying, hey, look, I know, like, it's a weird thing, but people wear these for a reason on Thunder Junction. And it's recommended that you, if you don't want to buy a hat, you at least bring one. Sun protection is really important here. You know, there's some sort of 
you know, ambitious Kaladeshi Etherborn family printing out <laughs> guides to travelers. This Real is all. I'm just st- sticking my own head cannon. Real but- quick, uh, the card requisition raid. Paul is the one that was uh, spoiled a day or two ago. Uh, that has for those watching the video it has big big bird. I, I promise it's on Scryfall. <laughs> While we're bringing that card up, there it is. Like, look, mm. that's a chocobo. Oh, it really does look like a yeah. chocobo. Yeah. <laughs> Work anyway. Well, who knows where that bird came from? Uh, people bringing their animals over. Uh, anyhow, so Annie Flash shows up where Oko told her to go to, which is this uh, the the Wild Card Saloon in Rustwood, and meets a motley crew of uh, of notable. And fan favorite bad guys, some of whom have a good reason to be here, and I'm assuming some of whom are here to sell the action figures, I mean the magic cards. Uh, We have Breaches and Malcolm, which are, uh, kind of explains why they had so much real estate in the LCI story. I mean, because they were there, they were investigating the mushroom thing. They were the third track of that converging narrative where everything sort of met and exploded in the middle. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah. And these are crew members from the belligerents. They are Va- Vraska's. The yeah, yeah, they're Vraska's old crew members from the belligerent, uh, and they're quite fun. And I like Breaches and Malcolm. Uh, Breaches is a little goblin that screams all the time. Uh, Malcolm is a very good lookout because he can fly. Also, uh, Malcolm's flavor text is "Gamers don't look up." Yeah, <laughs> it's funny how rarely folks here think to look up. <laughs> Gamers can't look up. Yeah, perfect. We have a uh, we have uh, everyone's favorite thief who I believe canonically has a family. Tiny Bones. Uh, Tiny Bones has a family. I think canonically, I think it's been referenced. I love Tiny Bones. I looked up Tiny Bones uh, and I can't remember where I read this, but yeah, Tiny Bones is there. Uh, Tiny Bones is from Urborg. Uh, speaking of people from Urborg, mentioned in the story, I don't know if they have cards yet. It's not super important. We have Karavec. Uh, Karavec does have a card. Mm-hmm. Spoiled. Um, yeah, Karavec is also from Dominaria. He's from the Mirage. He's from Mirage Block. Yeah, I didn't yeah. realize like Karavec way back was in the still day. alive. I honestly. didn't realize that either. I was very surprised to read that Karavec was here. Oh, yeah, Karavec the Punisher's here. Yeah, I was like, what are you doing here? Uh, we've got... Uh, 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 now, some of these people aren't here, so but they will be broken out of jail in the next episode. Satoru Umazawa is one of the members of this gang, and he uses cool Kaladesh stuff to be like an infiltrator guy. Uh, or uh, Kamigawa. Kamigawa, yeah, yeah. sorry. So I, so I, yeah, yeah, not... he, he gives the team ninjutsu. <laughs> yeah, I don't... Oh, wow. Yeah, he's cool. I just mm-hmm. don't know what he's doing here. Yeah, um, like the, the cast is a little too big. The cast is quite big. Rakdos is very is there, but barely ever seen because he's too big to go inside. And apparently Rakdos is just chill to stay outside and do Rakdos things, I guess. Yeah. I so I joked about this and I'm gonna just say it now. I when I this is I'm putting my own headcanon in here, but when I did the first bylaw in order, I put a lot of time into thinking about how rack how the Rakdos would actually function in a society that's been stand, stood for ten thousand years. And they can't actually be murder like like murder clowns. They're I, I sort of toned them down to like uh weird sexy theater kids who ha- who do social commentary and do a lot of like stuff with like blood and gore, but because there's healers around it, it's not as like terrifying as you think it is. Right. And it's clear that somebody in Watsi wanted to sort of turn down the weird gross sex death aspect of Rakdos because Rakdos because it doesn't make sense in a society well it doesn't make sense in a society and it's kind of uncomfortable yeah and I was like it's fine that they have assassins everybody's got assassins and stuff like that but like the actual like normal day Rakdos seems to be overall a pretty chill guy who just wants to chill out and have fun uh, and is not particularly bossy and the is not particularly like it is honestly like give him a bong and <laughs> he's a, he's a, he's more hedonistic than than murderous than murderous yeah yeah like i i thought the original concept for the cult of rakdos was that rakdos is mostly asleep yeah and the best way to keep him like that is to keep him entertained so the cult of rakdos is like trying to entertain him yeah with you know 
doing the murders yeah. that he would find amusing. Yeah. Um, and it, I don't know if he would actually find, I think he'd probably find lots of things amusing. So I can, yeah. just, I can just, it just really seems like they've just turned that knob a little bit down. Yeah, I mean, and honestly, I think it's I, fine. I, I I could go for an Adventures with Rakdos where he searches the multiverse for novelty. Oh yeah, oh I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, entertain me says the flavor text on well, Rakdos. The, on, the, the on the latest Rakdos, uh, in the one from Murders, MKM. Finally, a spectacle worthy of my applause. I believe. Yeah, uh, finally mm-hmm. a performance worthy of my applause. I wrote that flavor text. Yeah. Because he's just like, oh good, finally. Yeah, some, I'm finally some good used. effing food. And he just doesn't even wake up in that story. He's asleep the whole time. I really just think that the guy just like gets real drunk, has a great party, and then is like, okay, I'm like a super old demon, and you know, maybe I'm not as young as I used to be, so I'm just gonna sleep it off for a couple thousand years. Y'all keep me entertained in my stead. I mean, in this story, everyone or in the cards in this in thunder junction everyone has their epithets it's kellen the kid malcolm the eyes right and rakdos is the muscle yeah and again sort of leaning on tropes for movies he's as the muscle he's basically like do i get to punch them now and they're like no no not yet and he's like okay now can i punch them like no not yet and then eventually it's like okay rakdos that guy needs a punching and rakdos is like finally yes and like yeah it's just really excited to to get to do yeah and like rakdos does get to do that oh yeah he does get to do a violence oh yeah he does real keen about it yeah but i just don't understand why rakdos would be waiting to do a violence (laughs) i don't know either that doesn't yeah I, I mean, they're they're pretty explicit. So, if chaos is not usually in, associated with waits around patiently to take orders from small, tiny fairy. Yeah. Sorry, you were saying, or uh, just that, like, I Oko is paying them mm. with money. Why does Rakdos want money? Yeah, why does Rakdos? Why does Rakdos want a payday? <laughs> yeah. He's, uh, he's in it for the fun. Yeah, yeah. He's clear. I mean, obviously, yes. That is like the lore. The lore. He's just in it. He's in it because he thinks he's going to have fun. He mm-hmm. Rakdos finds Tiny Bones extremely amusing. There's been many jokes already that Tiny Bones is going to be brought back to Ravnica to become the new leader of the Rakdos Guild. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I, Judith is going to be turfed out for her uh, for her insolence and her betrayal. I, I could honestly see a universe where Rakdos just like you know wakes up one day on Ravnica, realizes that there's a multiverse out there to explore. Realizes also that living in a hole in the ground, while a cult you don't really respect tries to make you laugh, um, you know, kind of sucks. <laughs> it's like, well, I'm out of here. I'm going to go inspire the worst in an entire, you know, multiverse of people. Yeah. I don't know. I. It's I, weird. That's my, I think some of these people are here because people like them. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's fine. I think that's, I think that's, I think we're, fa- and I will talk about this later, we're facing the convergence of magic story. Magic is a story where you can do what you want and everybody has reasonable motivations because all of the art authors are super talented and all of the people plotting this story really do understand how stories are put together. And magic is the card game where we are marketing things, we have characters that we want to include because they're popular. And I think those two things are never going to mesh entirely. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you see the seams where they have been stitched together. Mm-hmm. Also in this uh, crew is Gisa and Garolf, because why are they here? Why Why would you want to? Why would these two goth kids want to come to Thunder Junction? Yeah, like Gisa so, has to so be like. Hot. Yeah, like it, Garolf. They're both from basically like northern Germany. Yeah, right. Like they're dressed. They don't, they don't even go out in the daytime there. <laughs> yeah. Geese has got to smell terrible. <laughs> oh, somebody, I read yeah. a tweet and I think it was from like incorrect MTG lore. And I think it was like, you can't tell me that Gisa doesn't sm- smell like she hasn't showered in like six weeks and Garolf doesn't smell like hand sanitizer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gar- I, I, I think it would be that Gisa smells awful because she's wearing the same black lace wedding dress and it's just like fully saturated with sweat. Yeah, and blood and, and icker. Yeah, and Garolf smells clean, and you don't know which is actually more upsetting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, Geese is there because she can raise ghouls, and she does point out, why are there so many dead people on this plane? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although she screeches it because it's Gisa. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Garolf is there as the medic. It's like, surely there is like... <laughs> yeah. Oh, we can't get anyone better. 
<laughs> it's a great, I guess, if you if I my arm gets severed and is fine and I have the arm, then great, he could reattach it. But otherwise, I don't know how much healing Geralt's going to do. Yeah, there's uh, there's uh, Ariette is there. She uh, as uh, she has been she uh, specializes in charms. And then we have Raska, an assassin from Ravnica, who is the second in command. Because realistically, if you are needing to assemble a crew of bad guys, Vraska is a great go-to. What is she doing here? How is she okay? They mention that she's got a lot of gnarly scars on her. Yeah. Bad, they yeah. do. They mention repeatedly how many scars she has. But, like, Vraska doesn't actually do a whole lot no, she, until she does. Yes. Right? She's doing Vraska She's things. very kind of, like, in the background, right? Mm-hmm. And... You know that's that's always someone you have to pay attention to, right? Like if you're if you're reading a play, and it gives you the list of the characters in a scene, and one of those characters just has no lines, they're there for a reason. Mm-hmm. 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 What are they doing? Yeah, I think Vraska is very fine to let the flamboyant, big talking Oko do all of uh, you know do things and just you know kind of weigh in if she needs to be like. Mm. Speaking of Oko, yes, uh, I know that we're trying to get through the summaries. First, I know. I'm but, sorry. Um, Kellen finally finds, confronts, meets Oko. Yes. What happened is they're at Prosperity, and they, the bad guy team with all Annie Flash, all of these people who are very, I don't even know why Ariette's there. I, I know why Ariette's there from like a writing reason, but she doesn't really need to be there. So just imagine like a big group of bad guys all moving together. The really relevant ones to the story are like Tiny Bones and oko and stuff like that um anyhow they're all trying to bust out karavek and umizawa from their from cells at sterling company headquarters and this is what happens in the second episode and things are going okay and then they're not really going okay uh they get kind of made and what happens is basically they they're getting out of the way and they uh they are leaving the headquarters after they've busted people out and oko recognized uh recognizes ral zarek as a planeswalker and then but then he recognizes somebody else who makes him stop uh and it was a boy with messy black hair and pointed ears and uh basically they're like they, you know, they yeah. have. A, they're basically like, wait, samezies, mm-hmm. samezies, samezies, uh, and uh, and he gets. Oko is so startled, his illusion falls off. So uh, Oko stiffened and his illusion faded away without warning, unable to hold in the presence of a fae he hadn't expected. In an instant, he was Oko again with no mask and no disguise. Who? Ralph started in alarm as the as his eyes fell to the box in Oko's arms. Tiny bones popped his head out. Tiny Bones is great. Uh, and uh, then basically uh, they have uh, they have a scrap and uh, uh, Oko hesitates and they talk to, he talks to Kellen and they are like, look, I have been, he, Kellen's like, I've been searching for you across multiple planes. Uh, and, and then all of this is happening. Ral's like, why aren't you fighting these people? What's going on? And then all of a sudden, Ral, Ral is going to go to knock out Oko. And he's like, Vraska? Because the last time Ral saw Vraska, he was dephyrexianizing her on, on, on Ravnica by like blasting her with some sort of energy bolt that like yeah. boiled the Phyrexian oil out of her blood. Oh, jeez. Yeah, no, yeah, it's I, I a always, gnarly story. I always wanted to imagine that that was like, you know, in Glass Onion, when they're going to get on the boat to go to the on- uh, to the island, mm-hmm. and that aide comes along and tells them they don't need to wear their masks anymore and gives them a spray in the mouth. Right. And it's just like, I don't know, peppermint oil or something. Mm-hmm. I always imagined that that was like what Ral was doing. Like, <laughs> did did you dephyrexianize her? What? <laughs> Yeah, like, like, you know, some 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 binaca just Yeah, yeah, the that Ral's device was only incidentally deforexianizing Vraska because it was devraskaing <laughs> the stuff he was interested in. Yeah. <laughs> Got to get all this Vraska away from the oil I want to experiment on. Uh She's and, looking well considering. Yeah. Uh but yeah, so basically a big a big a big kerfuffle breaks out. 
Uh, Tiny Bones grabs a cut pocket watch and Rakdos, who is there but not really doing anything, even though he could probably just crush everyone, says, ah, the jester thieves takes recompense for his hat. Rakdos observed in a rumbling but surprisingly musical voice. I said they were musical theater kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, Kellen was like, well, I'm going with you. I've been searching for you. I'm going with you, Dad. And Kellen and Oko's like, what? Okay. Yeah, Oko had never imagined himself as a father. He knows. He re- he looks at Oko, or he looks at Kellen. He's like, you look like Elise. Mm-hmm. You have her eyes. All of this wave of memories floods back. And he's like, uh-oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, so he said, Oko had never imagined himself as a father, but the boy had just helped him escape and had turned his on his own boss to do it. Kellen had shown loyalty without being coerced or tricked. He'd given it freely. Midway through their journey back to the saloon, Oko decided that having a son could turn out to be very useful indeed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Oko is a... <laughs> I don't know what people were expecting. No. Oh, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> so I saw somebody who was like, well, they could have done something with that. It's like, no, I think it's okay that some people are just deadbeats. Yeah. I mean, they are doing something with that. Yeah. Yeah. They're, Oko's not a good father. And I also like that Kellen is like, okay, well, I got what I wanted. What now? Yeah. Right, which is my favorite kind of of storytelling. When you get everything you want and then have to confront the fact that it isn't actually what will fix your life. And now you don't know what you're supposed to do because now you've done everything was this. Mm -hmm. Everything Kellen was doing in the last several sets was trying to find Oko. Mm -hmm. And now he's found Oko and it sucks. And now he has no purpose. Yeah. It's good. It's honestly a good... It's a good character moment. Uh, so anyhow, Kellen comes back to the saloon zone with all of these people and meets all of the other bad guys. He gets along best with Annie Flash because Kellen and Annie aren't really bad people. They've just sort of been sucked into this mess. So, you know, Annie Flash is also, this is, uh, I don't know much about the Navajo culture, but I know in um, First Nations culture, they have this concept of aunties and stuff like that, which yeah. are like older, wise women from the community. Well, it's it's it's... You know, everyone of kind of your mother's age. Is an auntie. Yeah. Annie Flash is being Kellen's auntie and giving him good advice. Yeah. And I like that. She's a good character. Um, anyhow, so Oko's like, oh, thank you. You're going to make a wonderful addition to the team. Uh, and uh, Kellen is about to say something. And then, uh, and then suddenly his breath hitched. He leaned over the railing, eyes wide with alarm. Oko tensed, ready to summon his magic at the first sign of danger. But when he followed Kellen's gaze to the corner of the room below, the crease in his brow vanished. Ashiok was drifting forward as if being carried by a storm of darkness. Black shadows curled around them, pulsing like a slow heartbeat. Recognition flooded Kellen's face, his concern the expression morphing into outrage. He gripped the wood tightly. Uh, and he's like, no, what, what is he, what are they doing there? They're a bad guy. They're a bad person. They're like, not good. So, cause I, I, I know your thoughts on this. I'm, I, I want to ask Cameron when, without, before getting to mm-hmm. the sixth story, when you read this, the Ashiok's there, <laughs> what did you make of that? I mean, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically. Um, I guess at that point you're sort of numb to like oh and they're here too okay, yeah yeah sure why not why not have ashiok this is probably like an extremely bad idea whatever this is yeah why the hell would you want to work for so when i was reading so i was so any, anyhow it's very interesting and then oko braced for a reaction from ashiok but it was ariette who noticed kellen first mm. mm-hmm. and ariette's like ugh of all the people to run into in Thunder Junction. She turned her nose up, white hair spilling over her shoulders as she glared at Oko. If I knew this brat was joining the team, I would have negotiated a higher fee. I would have thought Aria would have a more strong reaction than just ugh this brat, considering what Kellen... Uh, and Ruby did. And Ruby did to, to Ariette, but... They murdered her sister. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They threw her in a pot. And then they spoiled her plan uh, and threw her in jail. But anyhow, Oko's like, nope, 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 we're all here. And they have a big thing. And then then we go, they're like, Here, well, here's what we're doing. We're planning a train heist, which is, of course, another Western trope. Classic. Gotta have uh, a train they have robbery. a picture of a train in the magic story, but we, I don't think we've gotten a card for it yet. Uh, they're on the borderless, there's a panorama on the borderless variants of uh, Concealed Courtyard and Inspiring Vantage, all those lands. Mm. Um the uh, yeah, there's the front of it, botanical sanctum, uh, and it's a it's a full panorama of the uh, 
of the train, which it, runs on these giant cogs. It looks very kind of Kaladeshi inspired in the art they mm-hmm. put in the. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, the conce- that's not concealed. You could see that yeah. for miles. It's hard <laughs> it's, to have a concealed it's also, courtyard. In it's the also where... not a courtyard. I... <laughs> There's probably a courtyard inside the. Sure. Yeah, where you can't see it. Oh, Graham. Oh, okay. All right. You got me. <laughs> All right. So, what <laughs> they're doing me. on this train heist is they need to find an outcaster who has knowledge. Basically, they need to find a person who can give them information about where, uh, about the, the, the obsidian spur. No, not the, um, yeah. the, the hell spurs. The hell spurs. Tarn- where Tarnation is, essentially. Yeah. yeah. They, right, there's a town called Tarnation. Because they're looking for a key to a vault, and they have part of a key, but Akul, that terrifying scorpion dragon we met earlier, and he also kills someone in this story, too, as he's looking for the key part that's been stolen. That yeah, a lot Oko's of people just get has. killed. Yeah, Akul, Akul just kills people, even if he has no reason to, because that's how we know he's a bad dragon um anyhow they need to find an outcaster who's been taken by the sterling company uh and uh so anyhow they're doing this it's a big thing as usual hijinks ensue because gisa and Geralf are there uh and uh basically uh they've got a big mental link set up and uh it's uh, the basically uh, skies are looking cl- clear too malcolm announced breaches is ready to blow the bridge on your signal boom breaches shrieked excitedly is that the signal gisa cut in her giggling bordering on euphoric i can hardly stand the weight of course that's not the single Geralf tutted you're to race the corpses after breaches blows up the bridge and forces the train to stop we've been over it a hundred times corpses kellen tried to ask but no one has seemed to hear him over the necromancer's bickering stop telling me what to do gisa snarled back you're not in charge the only reason you're even invited on this job is because i allowed you to be and then more bickering and then finally ashiok didn't create a telepathic link for the two of you to argue like children Vraska scolded save it for after the mission right now we need to stick to the plan i can't think of anything i would want less in the universe than to share a telepathic link with any of these people oh with gisa and Geralf, (laughs) brutal oh Uh, it's very funny honestly (laughs) Sharing a telepathic link with, frankly, any nine people. Like, this is a yeah. lot of people on this party line. Yeah. This yeah, sounds this is like this would be like being, you know, your sense eight includes, I don't know, everyone who tweets too much. Whoa. <laughs> now, is setting up a telepathic link a thing that we've known Ashiok to be capable of in the past? Never seen it. Huh. Ashiok's, I don't think. Ashiok's powers are not well explained other than Fair messing around with people's dreams and nightmares. Fair enough. Uh, mm-hmm. But anyhow. No further questions. Carry yeah, on. I mean, like, yeah, it's probably some kind of telepathy that Ashiok could do. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, I, I admit, you know, I when I read it, I knew where this was going. But, uh, you know, looking at that, if you're reading it as it comes out, it's like, oh. I guess Ashiok does that. Okay, yeah, sure, right? Yeah. It's not... I think I think this is great, because it's like... It doesn't necessarily tip the hand. No, it's... Mwah, 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 mwah. I love this from a from a right, from an author's point of view. I love it when they put things out in absolutely plain language. They do not hide anything, but they don't draw attention to it either. They just mm. state facts. And once you have greater context, then suddenly they become clear. I love that. Great writing. Mm. I mean, like, my complaint here is that, like, everyone's internal monologue is the same as their external monologue, right? Like, it it mm. reads much more like a radio link than it does a telepathic one to me, mm. um, which, you know, it's, it's it's the trope, whatever, you know, they have comms. Um, it's a telepathic link, but you, like, choose when, when you're to say on... Things. I guess, which I guess it, it would be very interesting if you had a telepathic link that you couldn't really control in that way. Mm-hmm. You would think whoever is the most charismatic would be able to kind of dominate that mm. a little bit. Interesting. Yeah. You know, moderate each other or d- dismoderate, dismoderate, deregulate each other's emotions. We're going to mute Gisa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
server kick Gisa. Uh, <laughs> trying to hear breaches. Breaches only yells, and I can't hear him over Gisa right now. Yeah, exactly. Anyhow, as you can tell from that little excerpt I read out, things go wrong. Gisa raises the zombies too early. Breaches is like, basically, Malcolm says, How is he supposed to he- hear? How are we supposed to hear the signal? Shut up. Breaches, signal. <laughs> Gisa, signal. And everything goes wrong. They blow the bridge too early. The zombies come up too mm-hmm. early. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, that totally works. It's really funny, honestly. Uh, and it turns out that they can't stop the train in time. To, from going over the edge of the bridge because the conductor got eaten by zombies. <laughs> uh, Rush of the Dead is a card that's been spoiled. And I uh, think it shows this part. Showing the moment of uh, Giza raising the zombies too early <laughs> as they jump from train car to train car. Very fun. <laughs> Whoopsies. Uh, but anyhow, the issue, so they get the outcaster, who's this person named Nolan they're looking for, uh, and they can't, they can't stop the train. And Oko's like, well, peace. And Kellen's like, you told me we weren't going to hurt anybody. And Oko's like, well, things aren't going right. I don't know what to do. So Kellen, uh, after a bunch of people, after they all get off the train, Kellen uses his fairy magic to basically Spider-Man stop it. Mm-hmm. It did read to me. Yeah, like the Spider-Man to the, well, very deliberately not the same thing because it's. Because the nose of the train goes over the edge of the yeah, cliff. Yeah, but... yeah. But it was, Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I Kellen actually lassoes the train. Yeah, Kellen lassoes the train and 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 keeps it from going over the cliff till everyone can get out of the train, and then Annie, uh, Annie, who's basically his his helpful, nice, kind person, the one good other good person in this group of jerks, is like takes him back and and uh, and, and uh, they. They leave the wreckage and the Sterling Company behind. They got everything they wanted, just barely, and it all works out. So I have not read stories four and five, as I mentioned. Uh, can you summarize four and five? Uh, yes. And I will try to do, th- do it as quickly as possible because the real meat of the story is in six. Um, so anyhow, they look, they get this, they get this guy they get the information about the keys, the tar- the keys to this vault. There's six of them, and uh, Ashiok shows up and pulls the information out of this outcaster's head. And uh, Kellen is like, oh, this is not good. You said nobody would get hurt, but he's clearly scared. And then, you know, Kellen's not super loving what is going on here. Uh, but Ashiok is like, don't worry, I'm not going to kill him, and just takes the information out of his head, which appears as, like, silver strands of thread coming out. Mm. I don't know if silver is necessarily a color I would associate with Ashiok. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, Oko is looking for it, and at this point, this is, this is where Gisa and Garolf show up with the map to, to Tarnation that they got in their side story, and they know where Mog Taranau is, which is some sort of secret vault mm-hmm. in Thunder Junction. This is an interesting exchange. Uh, we can't just leave him here, Kellen blurted out. Hard bristles days away, and he's got no supplies or water. And Ashiok took a step closer, shadows rumbling al- along the desert floor like they were being tested. You fear for his life. It wasn't a question. Kellen opened his mouth, but the words were too tangled to sort through. Fear not, Ashiok said, curling their long claws. I'd not wish the man dead. Oh, how wonderful to see we're all on the same page, Oko said with a hint of irritation. So then Kellen and Annie escort the outcaster to a place where he's not going to die. How nice of Ashiok. Yeah. That's so chill. Also, Ashiok, still no reaction to Kellen, even though they've met. Yep. Hmm. 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 <laughs> so anyhow, they basically, as it turns out, we are sending, we, all of these people want to get to Tarnation, which is where the Hellspurs uh, hideout is because they need the other parts of the key to get into Mog Tanau or whatever I whatever Terran Terranau. I don't know how to pronounce it. It is M A A G T A R A N A U. So I'm going to say Mog Mag Mag Terranau. Mag Terranau. Uh, so they need to bust into Tarnation, which is where Akul, the horrible scorpion dragon, lives. And it turns out, at some point in these two stories, we reveal that everyone, Oko has maybe assembled the gang, but they're all working for Ashiok. Which at this point, I'm reading this, and even I'm reading this going, this isn't Ashiok. Why would Ashiok 
hire other people. Ashiok just does what Ashiok wants. This is way too organized for Ashiok. Mm -hmm. Ashiok looked at the Phyrexian invasion of the multiverse, poked around in Elish Norn's head, and was like, oh, that's what you're scared of. How interesting. And then just left. Yeah, yeah. This is uncharacteristic. It's uncharacteristically organized of Ashiok, I'm going mm -hmm. to say. So anyhow, Boy, someone really misunderstood that character. Yeah, but uh, we're, uh, well, uh, maybe, uh. maybe you know, we are between big bads and magic story. Maybe we're just setting up Ashiok for a new character turn. We've always, everybody's always liked them a lot. They're very interesting. Mm. So anyhow, we go to they get to Tarnation. Uh, Kellen says. All right, we're going to try to sneak into Tarnation. I'm going to take these people with me. Or so Oko says that. One of these people is Kellen. Kellen immediately gets them rumbled and gets them arrested. And they're all going to be killed. And Kellen is like, I know how to save things. I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you to a duel, uh, uh, cool. And Annie's like, oh, we're all going to die. And he's going yeah. to die first. Yeah, the, the thing that like struck me here was that a cool gets the key to the vault, wants it, and then... Kellen challenges him to a duel, and he's like, fine, we'll duel at midnight, and I will not use the key until then. Yes. Instead of, like, <laughs> immediately going to unlock the vault. Well, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's fine. fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> just, just put the key on a cool's nose. <laughs> wait. 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 Hold. Wait. Single Sit. bead of sweat. But so Kellen duels Akul and actually is doing okay because he he finds out he has a different kind of fairy magic. He has like a mind control magic mm -hmm. that he can he can use to sort of like put Akul into a trance, and he almost gets him. Why don't they send Rakdos? Surely Rakdos would be like, oh, I would love to kill hundreds of people. Yeah. But no, Rakdos is patiently waiting outside doing bong rips or whatever he's up to. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but writing writing his next like hilarious like parody song. <laughs> yeah, Rakdos's K holes out in the desert somewhere. <laughs> now, I like the I mean I like I, I my head canon is Rakdos is a big musical theater nerd, so mm -hmm. he's working on he's been asleep for a long time, but he's had he's got some thoughts about like a about how to bring the second act finale all in together. Yeah, yeah. He's sitting there at a player piano being like, hmm, ding, hmm, 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 hmm. Ding, ding, ding. He's sitting in front of okay, a whole okay, line yeah. of player pianos because he can get one key on one yeah. piano at a time. It's like a child's piano. Yeah, he's just trying to like work out this melody. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. This is not important. But as it turns out, while this huge fight is going on, Kellen almost subdues a cool, but then a cool snaps out of it and all looks lost when, hey, the Sterling Company cavalry arrives. Uh. Uh, it's Ral Zarek and all of those other people that are also looking for the key, and they uh, get into a huge fight, and Oko's like, all right, great. Uh, we've got the key parts because the key was knocked off Akul during the, 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 uh, the fight and let's peace and everybody's like aren't you go and aren't you going to help him and uh uh Kel and oko's like yeah no i'm just gonna leave my kid behind after he gets knocked out i'm sure he'll be fine uh, annie is very 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 angry uh and uh is really mad and uh is like no 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 that was my whole plan i brought Kellen with us because I knew that he would get us caught and then they would then that would kill time for the Sterling company to get there because I told them where Tarnation was. Mm -hmm. Honestly, clever. Uh and uh and that's fine. And we'll go back and get him. We have to do this, otherwise the Sterling company is gonna get there first and we'll lose what we're going for. We will go back and get Kellen. I absolutely promise we'll go back and get Kellen. And Annalise's like, eh. Uh, Annie's very mad but uh, Kellen wakes up he's been arrested by the Sterling Company and uh, Ral Zarek then breaks him out because Ral's like well because you gotta have a jailbreak <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, Ral says to him, I get it. Families are complicated and fathers are well. Ral's smirk was edged with sadness. They either make you or break you, I suppose. He held Kellen's stare. You still have a choice to be better than the hand they tried to, deal, to, deal, to deal you. By robbing the vault, Kellen challenged Defiant. Defiant, Oko has a history of lying, manipulation, and murder. You really want someone like that having access to the vault's power? 
No one should have that kind of power, Kellen encountered. But he's a better choice than Akul or Bertram Greywater. I agree with you, Ral said simply, which is why I want to make sure whatever is inside that vault stays locked up for good. Kellen's mouth parted and surprised. I came here to, mar- to discover new ways to communicate across planes, not to unleash a bunch of unchecked magic from an ancient vault that nobody here understands, Ral shrugged. I think you and I can help put a stop to what's caused to anybody who would cause this plane harm. So Ral's like, okay, look, I came here to do a communications project. I'm just here to set up telegraph lines. I'm not, and right now we have Oko, who we know is, an, uh, who I know is a known quantity asshole. We have Akul, who we know is a terrible person. And we have Greywater, who I don't particularly trust, all going for the same thing. How about me and you, kid, because I trust you from what from working together on Ravnica. You got just mixed up with your dad. I'm willing to forgive you if you're going to help me shut this whole thing down. Ral's not a bad guy, like Ral here. Mm-hmm. Also, I, I just wanted to comment on the name of the Sterling Company's leader, Greywater. Yeah. Hilarious. Um <laughs> it just reminds me of uh, uh, the mayor of my hometown for a long time when I was a very small child was John Backhouse. <laughs> he was actually a very good guy, uh, but you know his last name was Backhouse. And here we have a guy whose last name is Greywater. <laughs> Hilarious. You can you can I'm use very him. easily amused. You can use him to you know. Uh... Yeah, you take the Greywater and you pour it down the Backhouse. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can use him to like you know, like uh, wash the water the plants or something. Hmm. So we have the six stories quite long. We have a whole section where the gang sans Kellen uh, all uses their various magical powers to disarm traps and do things. I mean, not everyone does. Tiny Bones is by far the most useful person there. He can like take parts of his bone. He has he, like some he can sort of completely like completely disassemble himself. He has some kind of like central magical thing that kind of like yeah, holds the animation of the skeleton together. But he can like. Just be like, ah, oh, take this bone apart and chuck it over there and then pick it up and reattach it. During the fifth but story... But you cannot, so play safe. Oko What's is wearing, like, bone armor. Mm-hmm. That le- and uh, Kellen's like, why didn't he use an illusion? Because the bone armor is tiny bones. Huh? So when they're not attended, tiny bones drops off and reassembles himself and helps the rest of the crew bust out. Very cool. Tiny yeah, bones is cool. Taking advantage of the fact that the, um, the, the, the Hell Spurs have bone armor... Mm-hmm. Right, they're like a very kind of like I don't know, black aligned, black red dragon cult mm. in presentation. Right, I don't know if we've seen any art of them, but oh, uh, they there's sound some of cool. them exploding on various cards. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, they 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 get up to the vault. They disarm a bunch of traps and stuff like that. Karavek uses magic that apparently only he could use to get in uh and it's all like uh-huh oh, right. you, all, all there. these people are here ariette is like vaguely there uh, yeah, she didn't seem to do a lot why is she here? she's i i truly swear she's here for this big reveal yeah. so you can be like oh that makes sense anyhow as they as they are just about to get in akul's gang shows up and then ral and kellen show up uh and basically there's a big old fight. There's a huge big old fight. And some of them stay back to hold the Hellspurs off while a select few... Oko and Vraska. Head for the vault. Yeah, Vraska's like, look, we need to get in there. These people can hold them off. Let's go. Vraska being that cool and co- and uh, collected second in command, uh, basically. And uh, they fight with Ral and, and, and Vraska. Or Ral and Vraska fight. Ral says, "Why are you doing this? We were friends. Va- we are friends, Vraska. We were enemies once too." She replied. Electricity sparked in Ral's hands. You can still return to Ravnica. I don't know what happened to you, where you've been all this time, but it doesn't have to be like this. Vraska snarled. The only way to fix what I've done is by getting what's inside the vault. What does that mean? I don't know, but it seems like fix what I've done. I think that Vraska might have a tremendous amount of guilt for what she's done, which was go on a murderous rampage through the 10th district mm, mm-hmm. under partial. She was she was sort of aware of what she was doing and didn't want to do it. It's a really good story. I really recommend you read it, honestly. We see on the card here, Betrayal at the Vault, Oko on the left, Vraska on the right, and Kellen in the middle. Yeah, this oh, this is where they come out and clearly say, Oko flinched at her words. To fix what I've done, they ricocheted through, ricocheted through his mind like puzzle pieces that didn't quite fit. He knew Vraska took this job through, for the reward. He knew she'd been hired by Ashiok, same as he had. This is when I went, why the fuck would Ashiok hire anyone? He did, But what he didn't understand was the hunger in her voice. Like, she just didn't want the payday. She needed it. 
Normally, desperation in others was something Oko reveled in. It made people easy to manipulate and even easier to bargain with. But the people who kept their desperation a secret, they weren't pliable. They were dangerous. I like that. <laughs> so then... So then, uh, anyhow, Kellen and Oko have a bit of a showdown. Uh... As Oko pulled his attention from Vraska, feeling the heat of Kellen's anger, I was going to come back for you. You were, st- I was, we were still going to get your cut of the. You were still going to get your cut of the treasure when the job was finished. I didn't search you across the multiverse for treasure. Well, perhaps not, but you knew what I was here for, and you were a willing participant up until the moment you got caught. Oko pointed out, I treated you the same as any other member of my crew. But I'm not your crew. I'm your son. I wish you could see the difference. Get a good, so yeah, and then Oka basically Vra- Vraska and Ral are arguing, and uh, Oko either says, "You can either help me, or you can get out of my way." <laughs> Such a bad dad. Uh, anyhow, they are having a fight, and sp- and everything is happening, and it's all bad. And uh, then, uh, then suddenly, Ashiok shows up. The moment his fingers brushed against the key, Kellen recoiled in fear, clutching his temples as he released a blood-curdling scream. The sound was slurred in Oko's mind as if he were watching everything in slow motion. Shadows moved across the floor, wrapping around not only Kellen, but Annie and Ral, too. They cried out in agony, overwhelmed by the nightmare seeping into their heads. Kellen's magic faltered, and Oko blinked hard, breaking free of the illusory calm. He followed the shadows that swept, swept through the room, knowing who they belonged to. So, Ashiok shows up and says sleep now but interestingly enough oko is also possibly being affected by this or maybe mm. he's being affected by kellen trying to use his subdual magic on him but it doesn't matter they finally get into the vault the vault and something very exciting happens and this is when me and probably and i think the entire vorthos community had a big pop off so basically they go to the treasure realm there they get inside this vault it's all amazing it's endless but Ashiok and Vraska are making a beeline to something in the very center. Uh, at the top was of the innermost po- platform was a pod-like structure encased in glass. Metal stretched around the glowing sphere, marked with an ancient script and surrounded by threads of amber magic. Behind it was a mural of an enormous horned creature towering over the platform like a guardian. Oko frowned. <laughs> a shape moved behind the glass, too obscured by a, ha- a cloudy haze to make out property properly. This something was alive. Ashiok floated past him, feet barely touching the ground. At last, they mused, moving for the pod. They pressed their sharp nails to the glass, more tender than Oko had ever seen. I have found you. The creature brushed against the barrier, reaching for Ashiok's outstretched fingers. In that moment, an illusion drifted away, one that Ashiok had been wearing for some time. The darkness evaporated, and beneath Ashiok's hooded cloak was Jace Bellerin. Oko's nostrils flared. The trickster didn't appreciate being tricked in turn. How long have you been hiding behind your magic? He's still hiding. Annie stumbled through the doorway, focused solely on Jace. Her eye glowed a vibrant orange as she saw past the illusion that was he was still tucked carefully beneath. Your scars, those plugs, what happened to you? So Ashiok reveals that it's actually Jace. Which is why Ashiok didn't want to kill anybody, why Ashiok didn't uh, react to Kellen the same way Ariette did, why Ashiok was, you know... Doing te- telepathy powers. Yeah, yeah. Doing, yeah. Te- doing telepathy powers, you know... But also, Jace is further disguising himself to just look like Jace, whereas he underneath even that he still has like He's a bunch good. of weird post completion scars yeah like like frasca we're yeah. setting up for uh deadpool jace not breaking the fourth wall but like disfigured i think this will test very highly with teenage boys mm-hmm. 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 i thought it was cool and that's how i know it's like something that teenage boys will like because i <laughs> unironically know i have the taste of a 15 year old boy <laughs> i love king gizzard and the lizard wizard like go go no further <laughs> I do like the uh, the the art for Jace Reawakened, where it's uh, revealing from Ashiok. There's a borderless variant as well that's even uh, even cooler. Even cooler, I think. I think this is so the, cool. In terms of the the uh, the 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 revelation of Ashiok into Jace, there it is. It's very cool. It's looking. super cool. It's super cool. I love this. I think it's great. Anyhow, Vraska and Ashiok grab this sleeping cute baby or jace now or yes vraska and jace grab the sleeping cute baby thing 
and then they and then they peace. Yeah. yeah. They planeswalk because Jace is still a planeswalker. You'll notice from the card. Mm-hmm. I, I guess we could have mentioned that for those listening. He's but too yeah. powerful to lose his spark. Yeah, Vraska still sparkless. Jace is a planeswalker, and yeah. So then Jason Vraska and this this, <laughs> this thing? strange this child uh, planeswalk away, just gone. Mm-hmm. And everyone else is like, "Well, what? How how is Jace planeswalking with people who don't have sparks? I how did know. he get Aria there in the first place? I assume Jace might have some Omen Path powers. Mm. Interesting. I just I don't know how this works. And uh, anyhow, uh, uh, Vraska tries to petrify Oko, and no one's sad about it. But Oko just planeswalks out of there. Uh, and uh, anyhow. After that, they all, they all, they basically, Kellen and Ral and Annie Flash try to escape. Rakdos is in, is in the middle of, like, sitting on top of Akul, having beaten him. And mm-hmm. is, like, not tearing his limbs off, which I find to be very un But maybe he's just talking about, how would you rate your subduel there? Like, you know? <laughs> uh, were you amused? I was amused. Uh, but um, they all escape, and uh, Rakdos is like, Look, I've been ridden before. Uh, Rakdos Huff. They all escape off the top of this big vault that's floating in the sky by riding Rakdos down, except for Kellen and Annie, because Kellen can fly. Rakdos Huff. I have sworn never to be ridden again. Let it be known this is the last and final time. This is not even the last and final time in this magic story that he gets <laughs> yeah. ridden. I think he likes it. <laughs> I think he Rakdos, Rakdos should be a mount. <laughs> oh, in the story. In the story. Or in the on the cart mechanically. In the card, mechanically. Yeah. You should, should be able to saddle Rakdos. Yes. A tiny only only tiny bones should be able to saddle <laughs> Rakdos. Uh, it's different than partners with. It's yeah. it's similar but different. Yeah. yeah. So then uh then uh then as they're about to escape, uh Kellen and Annie are gonna go down together and Akul tumbles out and tries to get Annie and Kellen was like, Well, I got to do it. And he uses his magic to make Akul go back inside the collapsing vault and presumably kills him. Uh, so, yeah. And then Oko comes back to the saloon where all the bad guys are and says, eh, we got double crossed by Ashiok. Um, did I, does he tell them it's Jace, it's Jace Bellerin? I don't think I don't so. Cause they, Kellen and Annie run for the exit past the others and they're all like, but what about, Oko and Vraska and Ashiok, and they're just like, ah, they got out. Don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think they come out of this all thinking that they've been had by Ashiok. And all mad yeah. at Oko, which I'm sure is fine mm-hmm. for Oko. There's definitely going to be a story where Oko gets his comeuppance. Yeah, well, because they, they, all, they all then meet up at the bar later, and they're like, so what are you going to do about this, Oko? And Oko's like, right now, nothing. Uh, you know, he's like, eventually we'll, we'll, we'll make this right when, when they misstep and then we'll then we'll take our revenge on them then but for now i don't know y'all want to do another job and everyone's like no i'm really mad at you still but i guess maybe i don't know call me like <laughs> uh, yeah the thing that occurs to me now is that like the disguise as ashiok is kind of interesting because i think these are all people who have been owned in the past by ashiok or at least have reason to be afraid of them mm. Mm. right no but none of them would respect jace right but they would fear ashiok hmm Mm. Right, fear and respect enough to take a payday from Ashiok, rather than sense. take one from Jace. Yeah. So, yeah, it's weird. Anyhow, the end of the story, Kellen's hanging out at, El- at Annie's farm. Ral's like, hey, do you want to come with me on another job? And Kellen's like, eh, no, I need some time to find myself. I've been on this huge journey. Also, I'm expecting someone. Mm-hmm. Tee Tee and then everyone's favorite person mm-hmm. everyone's like the breakout hit uh of uh lost caverns of ixalan and a banger card in her own right amalia shows up with a parasol and lots of layers because she is a vampire but apparently she's the kind of vampire that can go out in the sun and doesn't need to eat people it doesn't matter <laughs> i don't care it does just fine and uh they are going to have some some smoochy romance mapping thunder junction and i can't wait she's so excited to map this place yeah she's super into it also Raul is tr- trying to uh um uh he's like <laughs> he's he he's really keen on Annie's uh baking <laughs> at the end there he's he like this is Tomek's home cooking yeah he's like he's like ooh can i just i'm just going to invite myself over for dinner <laughs> 
thought that was very funny. I like Ral. So anyhow, I want to talk a little bit about what the hell they were getting. Uh, we, all we know is that it was something called, they were breaking into something called Mog Tarnow, and they picked up something that looked furry, and there is a picture of a big beast with two big horns. And here's what everybody is speculating, and oh, it ties yeah. into Lost Caverns of Ixalan. Because do you remember uh, Quintorius was looking up something called the Coin Empire? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and these were some sort of race of interplanal interplanar conquerors, uh, and uh, they had taken over the they had they had chained up Chimil, the inner sun in Ixalan thousands mm -hmm. of years ago, but they had been they had been um, they had been uh, pushed back or whatever, and anyhow, people. In the in the story, they're just called the Coin Empire. But if you look at the cards, Master's Manufactory and Cartographer's Companion, mm -hmm. they uh, they they are referred to as the Fomori. Ever since the Fomori's attempt long ago to extinguish Chimiel's light, the Altec have taken extensive measures to never get lost in the core. Is what Cartographer's Companion flavor text says. I love it when they. I love this. I love this because it's like, ooh, it's a little puzzle to uh, to 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 figure out. It was very strange seeing references to the Fomori and flavor text on Ixalan. Yes, it was like because wait, it's a very like British Isles kind of like monster, right? They're the Fomori are like bog monsters. They they yeah. are Celtic yeah. beasts, uh, ha, uh, and uh, they're from a plane called Ear, which has really only been seen on one plane chase card. Uh, which we've seen, uh, we've seen the plane of ear and plane chase, and then it's, is it just like Ruhan of the Fomori is the only yeah. like yeah? There's some I've I've sent a, I've sent Paul a bunch of links and stuff like this. But I, I'm wondering if ear is act, is it pronounced like that or is it iry? I I I I don't know. Well, all we know is that there's it's a little the, on the nose. Isn't the, it? Yeah, a little on the yeah. Ear features Turi Island, and uh, because I like to put references in in the very first intro for bylaw order two it talks about what to do if you're being play if you're being chased across the standstill sea because the sea is very i don't know to like there's this part in in chrono cross where you walk across the frozen sea oh yeah i love that that was mind-blowing to me as a kid the the frozen the, the frozen in, in time sea so that that's how i choose to interpret this but being chased across the standstill sea by a turian mega crab hmm so, anyhow, nice. that's all we know about this. But what we know about the Fomori is that they are some kind of Celtic-inspired thing that they've been shown on just a couple of cards. And Paul, I think we have we can bring up those cards that we've seen. You're talking about like Ruhan, for example. Or? Yeah, uh, there's uh, there's Fomori Nomad. There he is. There's Ruhan. And then there's, there's big, Ruhan of the Fomori. Big horns. And there's Fomori Vault is also coming up. Fomori Vault, you say? It, at least in in-game references. Oh, look at it. Big Horns again. Yeah, Big Horns. Sort of sounds similar to what we were talking about. Um, and interestingly, what does what does Mog Tarano mean anyhow? Hmm. Uh, so somebody much smarter than me... Uh, on the MTG Vortho subreddit, and props to the MTG Vortho subreddit for getting all of this information. Uh, this person was, uh, who did this? This was Novus Lion, said that they were curious as to the origin of the Fomori Vault on Thunder Junction because the name was peculiar. So they went digging and found words, uh, the definition of the words in Celtic language is roughly translating to Thunder Plane. Hmm. Okay. And like... This I'm is the kind of thing I would do. Yeah, the, the, the idea that like Thunder Junction is um, a wasteland, but maybe has not always been so because Gisa says, you know, there's an awful lot of corpses here um, mm. to work with. Yeah. Why are why are there so many corpses? She screeched, I think is the example. Yeah. And I was like, mm, wow, brilliant. You're asking the questions I wanted to ask. But yeah, the Fomori is the name of a mythological adversary race in Irish mythology. Mm -hmm. oh. So maybe these are our next big bads. What did Jason Vraska want with them? I don't know. I don't know either. So it's is just the, a cute is the little theory baby. that is the theory that Thunder Junction is ear or ire? I don't think it's ire or yeah, I don't think it's ear or ire or however we'll say. Well, I'm sure we'll. But be it's a place later. the Fomori at one time had were in presence. control of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're on con we're in control of. Just like at one point they were present on Ixalan. Mm -hmm. hmm. 
Uh, and so my favorite reaction to all of this, because boy, like I said, the Vorthos community popped up, is uh, somebody made a custom, made an altar. Oh, yes. <laughs> Of this, crime novelist? Of crime novelist, which I... So I wrote this flavor text, and I wrote it because this... This was actually this person disguised as a very, very common crime novel mystery trope. And so looking at the expression on her face, mm. which is like... Like, she's having a great time. Little Fibble tongue. Fips on this card hiding under the desk. I was like, this is a good place to put something goofy. Oh, man, Fibble Fips is there. Yeah, Fibble Fips. I have not seen... Oh. This yeah. is a silly card, so you can put silly flavor text in. But Will29 from Reddit did this altar. But then he peeled off the cloak, revealing a sight that make Oko, made Oko's blood run cold. Ashiok was actually Jason Disguise. <laughs> and it's just perfect. Yeah, uh, going to get a lot of mileage out of this flavor text. Uh, this oh, yeah. I think. I, Very nicely done. I, I, I look but, forward to future alters of it. Uh, my favorite detail on this card actually is how the novelist is holding her quill in a fist. <laughs> yes. She's so I, excited. Yeah, like I, I once, I once watched a barista take down an order with holding a pen, like a ballpoint pen, in a fist, in just like the most elegant copper plate script. Ooh. As she like moved from the shoulder. To write and it was like the most specifically evolved handwriting technique I had ever seen. Huh. It's impressive. Amazing. All from yeah. the, the shoulder. I like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is it was a big it was a big surprise. No one really saw that coming. I will point out in the murders at Karlov Manor set, uh, while Alquist Proft was knocked out, a mysterious hooded figure showed up in his mind palace. And said, don't mind me just looking for something, and yeah. left. And Alquist is like, who are you? Who are you? What are you? How did you get in here? Because Alquist Proft is a very sophisticated mind mage himself. Ah. Uh, but he's no match for what everybody at the time was like. People are like, that's got to be Jace Bellerin, right? Who else would ha be that's, able to do that? That's Jace's music. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. Uh, so, yeah. The idea that Jace can just show up in someone else's mind palace is very funny. Yeah, you, he's just like Kramer. <laughs> so, Alquist. Every I I I really like this story. I like that it was picked up threads that they had been teasing. This is a good conclusion to Kellen's arc because I think a lot of people will complain that Kellen is a bit of a Mary, Mary Sue kind of character, which is fine. I don't think I don't yeah. think Kellen's been getting enough criticism for being that character. Kellen's been a really frankly up until this story not very interesting character who's just like, hey, I'm generically great at everything. What's going on? And yeah. it's, I have not enjoyed Kellen up until the Thunder Junction stories. <laughs> I liked him. I really did not like him in Ixalan. I did not see the point of having him there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to be completely honest with you, I think you could have skipped Kellen and Ixalan, but I guess they just wanted him to show up in every story as a bit of a through line, and then we wouldn't have gotten Kellen and Amalia, which is many people's OTP, I suppose. I'm sorry that the, I'm sorry that Kellen didn't get to have the sort of uh, fresh Prince "Why don't you want me, man?" scene. I mean, he yeah. had a bit of a "Why don't you want me, yeah. man?" scene, a little bit. He's pretty, pretty <laughs> upset. He's taking it fairly well, considering. Well, mm -hmm. Oko's not actually been kind or nice or very fatherly to him the entire time that he's met him. And basically, with the stand off the vault, he's like, you know what? Screw you, Dad. You completely suck. You abandoned me, and you know what? I, I mean, I'm not sorry I looked for you because I got to do cool things, but I don't care about you. No. Get get wrecked and i think that's a good moment of character growth i think that brings his story and i'm glad that they kept oko as just some sort of selfish scheming prick mm -hmm. yeah yeah he um he, you know he has moments of like having a feeling yeah and then he reacts like a lot of people do when they are confronted with having a big feel which is trying to kill it by doing something that you can't come back from yeah yeah right? yeah it's great i think because you mentioned at the top of the show that we would touch on this uh, broad strokes for Thunder Junction, we've you know we've had some nitpicks here and there, and you know broadly speaking, I am I am sort of I you know I am enjoying very much the uh, the 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 setting and the tone and things like that. There are some things, and we don't know this. I I know that we talk about how you know we've we have some some amount of sort of internal knowledge. We don't know this, um, but it is suspected that they had intended to do 
maybe some kind of aftermath style epilogue thing and then uh, same as the assassin's creed stuff which they have said um that that was received very badly for a variety of reasons and then they didn't do that uh for assassin's creed certainly i think that that is also true here because there is a bunch of people in this set that i'm like what that why are they here mm -hmm. and like I suppose, uh, actually, something you said off camera, Kathleen, was that you know you sort of look at Thunder Junction like this is the beach episode where it's like all your all the characters that you know are here and they're all wearing cowboy hats for some reason because they're you know it's just having fun. But it's like once Marchesa showed up, the Gitrog monster. Yeah. There's a bunch of other characters who are not in these stories, and I'm like, why are you here? This Surely Marchesa does... is busy at home. Being the Surely, queen of Fioria. She, well, I mean, like, Surely know, she has an assistant she could send. Well, I mean, like, I, I, I think a lot, of, historically, a lot of monarchs have just sat on their ass and not really done a whole lot. Um, <laughs> you know, That's taking true. a vacation is fine. Um, or not fine, but it's, you know, expected of people who are extremely wealthy, who say they work extremely hard all the time. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, just the idea that, like, this, I feel... Um, is a very strong use of magic story in that it is like a self-contained uh, story that with a beginning, middle, and end, and it um, it has a broader context mm. that it is working within. But you know, it's it's its own thing, and I think that works quite well for this format of uh, um, episodic short fiction. Mm -hmm. um, it's certainly a lot better than it did for things like uh, March of the Machine. Which should have been, you know, two or three novels. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is again, like you, you have a very self-contained story that has so many people in it who don't get any interesting things to do, rather than doing the explicit thing that they were brought there to do. Right, um, and that sounds. How do I want to structure this thought? I get that Oko assembling a team to bust out an extremely valuable thing from a different thing that is complicated and now has access to the entire multiverse of talent summons the best people he can find right that makes a certain amount of sense to me yeah are you just going to get some like safe cracker from thunder junction who we've never seen before or do you get Kervac? right do you send the wolf that's all you had to say um <laughs> and that makes sense to me what do you offer them a lot of cash I, I don't. I don't know. It would be interesting if Oko came out of this with this intricate series of promises that he was actually bound to fulfill for these various people. Who, you know, if you're going to get the best people in the universe, they're going to want something probably more than a couple grand. Some sort of like fey contract obligation. That yeah, I, I think that would Oko, be kind of interesting. Oko is like it, compelled to to deliver on. Yeah, I guess. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um that'd be interesting. I yeah. Uh but I think those two things are kind of just in a little conflict with each other where you want the self-contained story, but you're also drawing on a lot of other characters from a very big universe. Um and they don't really get their chance to shine all that well. Um but I suppose you have roles to fill in a team, right? You need a safe cracker, you need a sharpshooter, you need the muscle. You need the 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 demolitions expert. I, I swear Ariette is in this story just so you can go back and read, hey, yeah, Ariette always reacted to Kellen, but Ashiok didn't. Yeah. And Ashiok should know who Kellen is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ariette is like the 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 charmer. Right. Yeah. The face. Or not the face, I guess that's Oko. But you 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 know, the the um the front person. Yeah. 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 Well, she doesn't do much. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. P part of these people are here because they are popular cards and mm -hmm. people like to build commander decks around them, which is why you have a bunch of these new legendary creatures here, because they may or may not have been in some kind of aftermath set that they decided they didn't want to do because selling six cards did mm -hmm. not go over well no. and nobody was happy with it. Mm -hmm. Um even if this aftermath set was all just like legendary creatures and whatever they pulled out of the vault. Yeah. Uh, I, I came away from this thinking like, okay, this is a good use of magic fiction. I like this. Or magic story was well deployed here. Um, I still wish there was more of it. Yeah. I wish there was more depth to it. I, I always approach these, um, you know, uh, uh, game supported genre fiction 
uh, pieces through the lens of like my experience with Games Workshop and Black Library, where if you throw money at authors and, you know, magic, Watsy has access to a broad stable of, you know, fairly talented writers mm-hmm. whose work I've liked. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just just invest in them, trust them, give them space, give them time. This I don't even feel that this is a big ask, right? Sure, throw out some pulp paperbacks. Yeah. Um, but that- and like Games Workshop has been doing this for decades. And they have, you know, is there's Games some. Is Games Workshop a publicly traded company? Uh, yes. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say, because that doesn't sound like it makes Hasbro any more money. Oh, and I mean, uh, like, WotC is the golden goose that's keeping Hasbro afloat right now. Yeah. Uh, Sounds I like mean, it Black only... Library sells a lot of a lot of paperbacks. That's fair. To, um, to arguably a narrower audience. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I feel like if you want to do this, there's models out there. It works well. And sometimes Games Workshop, you know, sometimes you get no, no fear. Sometimes you get Battle for the Abyss. Um, I don't know what that means. Oh, I'm inferring sometimes from you get context. Good, yeah, sometimes some, it's good and sometimes yeah, it's really Yeah, sometimes bad. you get something that rules and sometimes you get something that you're like, I regret this. <laughs> I regret this on your behalf. <laughs> yeah, I I feel bad that an author was asked to write this because you know it's 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 a job, it's yeah. a gig, right? Um, and I yeah, yeah, there there are some situations where that gig is a reasonable ask of an author, and sometimes where it's not. <laughs> I also want to say there's been two really divisive reactions to this main reveal: the Vorthos community, which was on it from day one. Because yeah. obviously the Vorthos community is reading the stories as soon as they come out. And basically all of the threads, if you go to MTG Vorthos, they're very positive. People being like, I didn't see that coming. That was cool. That explains that. Uh-huh. Like people being like, yeah, that's great. And then you have the non-Vorthos community going, uh, Jace is back. Uh, he sucks. If he had, he's the worst. He's so boring. Jace is not boring. Jace is Jace got very heavily character rehabilitated in the Ixalan stories. The original the original Ixalan Ixalan stories. They were incredible. This is where Breaches and Malcolm and Vraska really got personalities. Breaches and Malcolm are from those, and they're still beloved legendary characters today. This is Vraska and Jace's sort of like enemies to lovers meet cute. It's really good. It is very well written. It is, in fact, written by somebody, it was written by Allison Lurs, who now works in a very high-level position at Bungie. She's the narrative designer. She's the narrative designer. For Destiny 2. Yeah. So, like, she's written by somebody really who really knows what they're doing and is a really good writer. Very talented. Mm -hmm. And I think at some point we should do a tap-tap where we just, like, these are old, but this is why people like Jace, and this is why they are excited to see him come back, because this is what we're hoping for. But the magic mm-hmm. writers now are very good. They're all very talented writers. And I'm somewhat biased because I do know some of these people professionally through work. But I will say that they are all legitimately good writers. Like, we're talking about people who have been nominated for Hugo Awards multiple times. Mm-hmm. They're, I, yeah. they're got, they're, Watsi is doing their best. And I know that they're, that like I said earlier, you're having the intersections between great story, important narrative, and it's also stapled onto a collectible card game. And there's characters who are going to be here for no reason other than we want to print their cards. Yeah. And like, Hasbro's told us we need to make more money. Yeah. Like last time I was on one of these, somebody wound up snitch telling to like Sean and McGuire and uh, uh, K. R. Snow. Uh, oh, God. What's her Rivera? Name? Yeah. I follow her on Twitter um, about like how I had said that like this wasn't as good as Warhammer stuff. And I was like, that wasn't what I said. I said... Warhammer authors get a whole book. Yeah, they get a whole book. They get a whole book, and it pays off frequently. And I think think we've repeatedly said, Magic Story, you have people with good ideas. I truly believe the people in the narrative department are wanting to tell interesting and good stories. And you have really talented writers. But if you only give someone 10,000 words or 50,000 words or whatever it is then there's only so much they can do. You can't build depth and character interactions. My D&D campaign mm-hmm. was 50,000 words. <laughs> yeah. I, I, <laughs> right? I don't know what Thunder Junction feels like. Right? Mm-hmm. I don't know what this, what this environment feels like. I don't know, like, the, you, you, you get good authors 
who can tell a story, but the the scope of what they're able to do in the word count that you give them is so limited that they can only hit the like the 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 narrative like connect the dots. Yeah. Right. And then you have to introduce like twelve characters. Yep. Through that. And you don't get a chance to really like feel the place that you're in. Yeah. Mm. And I think that like honestly, Magic Story is in a really good spot. And I really do recommend you read it because it's fun and you get to, and like, because if you only engage with it from the cards, you just see this big cavalcade of legendary creatures. What are they doing here? The answer is they're just here because, like you said, it's the beach episode and mm. it's fun and everybody gets to put on a different costume and go on some wacky hijinks, but they're not actually in the story. And so you can't criticize. That's not a story decision. Mm. Yeah. Right? That's a marketing decision. That's different. Yeah, I... Well, I, then, I, I, then I criticize it. <laughs> well, the, the okay, the magic story here I think worked. The main yeah. line one oh, episodes yeah. one through six I think worked. Um, I agree. It was the, fun. It strained under it. I felt, but like this was probably uh, a very strong deployment of it. The side stories, which I have not gone to yet, um, have historically been a lot more interesting than the main narrative story because they don't creak under the requirements of what. Um, an unreasonable amount of uh, uh, expectations. Yeah, they're but, but the side stories are literally to give character to do something off to the side. So there's way less points that you need to hit. Way less stuff needs to happen in that story from a mechanical perspective. Of they need to get from this point to this point, and mm -hmm. they need to establish. They need to do all of these things along the way. And so it gives those characters more time to breathe and interact and sort of inhabit the world and build the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I do want to say. Uh, Kemi Don Bowen wrote the stories here, and I think that they're really good. They're very good. They're very fun. I popped off through for the reveal of Jace. The Vorthos oh, yeah. community is into it. We are excited to see where this goes. I'm excited to see what Jace is up to, what the Fomori are up to. Um, I th my personal headcanon for why Jace is posing as Ashiok is I think when he got completed, he could see, and we know he could see into Elish Norn's head because she just communicated with him telepathically. So Ash, so Jace uh, would have known, would have been able to see what what uh, Elish Norn was most afraid of, which was Ashiok. Mm. <laughs> maybe, well, maybe it was technically Elspeth because that's what Ashiok saw in her nightmares. But right. she she did not like Ashiok. Yeah. So I, he would have been like, oh, that's a good one. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'm going to disguise myself as the scariest motherfucker in the in the multiverse. Yeah, this this person <laughs> yeah. rattled uh, Elish Norn. Yeah, and ain't no I, one gonna ask questions if I come up to somebody looking like this. Yeah, and if I'm acting a bit weird or off, that's probably just like people will. How many people have had dealings with Ashiok? Yeah, no yeah. one, no one knows Ashiok. So if 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 you don't act exactly like Ashiok, they'll be like, I guess that's just what Ashiok is like. From a from a from a internal game knowledge perspective, at some point I I read, and I don't know how true this is, that at at early. Early in development, Ashiok was considered sort of like Nega Jace. Mm. Oh, okay. Sort of like the dark side of telepathic mind-reading powers. Right. And Ashiok has morphed into their own beautiful nightmare thing. I love Ashiok as a character. I was starting to get mad. I was like, why is Ashiok being so organized? What does Ashiok want with stuff? <laughs> Ashiok's never been a materially motivated person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Turns out. Well, nightmare being, I guess, yeah. but yeah. Hey, that's going to do it for this episode, I believe. Yeah. Um, let us know what you think of any of these stories. If you've read them, uh, pop off in the comments. Yeah. Let's talk about Wait in. lore. Wait yeah. in. And yeah, like I think a lot of the complaints are justified. I think some of them do not come. I think some of them come from a, well, yeah, Jace is just like the generic good at everything character, which he hasn't been for many years at this point. It's yeah, been like about a, seven years. Yeah. 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 I think Feel the Ixalan story really turned me around on Jace. Me too. Yeah. yeah. I hated him before the Ixalan yeah. story. I was yeah. like, oh God. And then I read it. I was like, well, I'm mad, but I'm in for it. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That was great. Thank you both. Appreciate that. Uh, and thank you all for uh, listening. A reminder, of course, that Tap Tap Can See is brought to you by Card Kingdom at cardkingdom.com slash LRR. Use that code when you buy your stuff because it lets them know that we sent you over there. 
Also, you can check, you can uh, support us and everything we do here directly at patreon.com slash loading ready run. We really, really appreciate you continuing to let us do all of these things. Uh, until next time, I have been Graham, joined by Kathleen. Bye-bye. And Cameron. Huh? Paul's been on tech. Heather gets these online. Thank you all so much for watching and listening. And we'll see you next time. Episode 500. Woo!